The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 6 Following Jedediah's instructions, Aaron and Kemper had gone round to the back of the derelict cotton mill and picked up a narrow track that led through a dreary mass of dying trees. The route was originally a horse trail, but now it wasn't much more than a footpath lost in a tangle of vines. The lack of footprints of any kind suggested that the path wasn't used very often, at least not by people. At first, Erin had been reluctant to go deeper into the woods, but now she was kind of glad to be leaving the old gin with its unnerving collection of mutilated junk. The thought had occurred to her that Jedediah might have made all that stuff himself. Perhaps what she'd previously thought of as the products of a sick mind may have been, in fact, the results of a twisted, dislocated form of plague. But almost immediately, she dismissed the idea. She couldn't see the little boy climbing up onto the roof to bolt those crazy bone sculptures in place. If Kemper had been a bit more patient, Aaron could have spent more time talking to Jedediah to see just exactly where the boy fitted into all of this. But Kemper had wanted to get going, which Aaron understood completely. Like Kemper had said, the damn goalposts just kept moving on them. The original plan was that they were meant to be waiting for the sheriff at Crawford Mill. Only now they had to leave the mill to go find the sheriff's house. They could have gone by road, but none of them were sure of the way round, and Jedediah had said it was only a short walk. So here they were. Save for the odd curse at being caught in some weeds, the two of them walked mostly in silence, their internal springs coiling tighter and tighter in an emotional holding pattern until they could finally get rid of the girl's body, then let it all out. And there was another reason, other than the heat, why the air was so heavy between them. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Asked Kemper, unable to contain it any longer. Straight away, she knew what he meant. I wanted you to propose for the right reason. She answered. What do you mean? Aaron stopped walking and faced him. I want you to marry me because you want to. Not because you have to. Which was pretty much at the heart of Aaron's previous dilemma, whether or not to reveal her pregnancy to her boyfriend. If he didn't know and they got engaged, it could only be for love. But with the baby, it could be for obligation. Kemper took his duties pretty seriously, and she knew how he'd react. He'd perform his duties as a father the same way he'd diligently check tire pressure at shop. But Kemper didn't see it that way. He loved Aaron. Okay, he might not always be the best at expressing how he felt, but she should know by now. She should know he'd marry her if he had to. I will, I promise. Kemper assured her. I'm just waiting for the right time. Yeah, sure. Replied Aaron, seeming unconvinced. Then she turned and walked ahead along the trail, making sure that Kemper couldn't see her slight smile. Oh, the fun, the excitement, and the sheer mind-numbing tedium of watching Andy do push-ups. Morgan and Pepper sat quietly near the entrance to the mill. What else could they do? Aaron and Kemper had only been gone ten minutes or so. They'd have to find their way to the sheriff's house. They'd have to explain everything to him, all over, and then they'd have to bring him here. They could easily be gone for half an hour or more. So now boredom had got the better of shock and fear. They had a dead girl in the van, 
they were stuck out by what looked like a cross between a taxidermist and an art gallery and a death camp. It was hot. None of them had anything left to say. They were bored. Bored. B-O-R-E-D. Bored. Though their minds had begun to adapt to the awfulness of their circumstances, Pepper still kept watching the doorway leading into the mill. Jedediah had never actually said whether he'd been alone in there or not. In fact, everything he said was pretty much a riddle of some kind. Well, at least Andy wasn't going to waste any time. As soon as Kemper had set off, he'd got down on the ground and started his exercises. His tense muscles gleamed with perspiration as he raised and lowered himself from the Hey! shouted Andy. Jedediah had opened the back door of the van and was poking the corpse with a stick. You sick little mutant. Andy called, climbing to his feet. That's police evidence. What the hell was the kid playing at? Why wouldn't he leave the dead body alone? Jedediah stepped away from the door and looked dejectedly at his stick. He'd prodded the body, but it hadn't moved. And now he could see that the end of the stick was wet with blood. The girl was dead after all. Pepper saw the strange expression on Jedediah's face. She thought it was a look of sadness, but she couldn't quite tell. That poor boy. She observed. I bet he doesn't have many friends. Morgan took in the abandoned mill, the sprawling thicket of the landscape, the kid with the stick, and snorted derisively. <laughs> I wonder why. But to raise a family with you, said Kemper excitedly, and to have a bunch of little tykes running around, teaching them about cars, going to car shows, taking them on vacation every year to the Indy 500. Suddenly, they were out of the woodland and the air had become sunny and almost cheerful around them. Kemper had charmed Aaron. He had spent the whole way convincing her that he was the right man for her. He wanted to be her husband. He wanted to be the daddy of her kids, and Aaron loved it. This was the Kemper she first hooked up with all those years back, not the dope-smuggling moron showing off for his friends, though she didn't mind him messing with his buddies as long as he did it on his own time. Kemper had suddenly stopped talking, and Aaron could see why. They had reached the end of the trail and could now see the farmstead on the plains. At first, their eyes were drawn to the tall, water-pumping windmill. Most of the steel blades were missing from the wheel perched at the top of the tower. Nevertheless, the wheel turned slowly, creaking, evenly catching the wind that was now rushing in waves through the long grass that had grown unchecked over the gentle rise that led up to the house. Kemper took a good look at the place. The farmhouse was a large and imposing two-storied building constructed in the plantation style, but the design of the place was almost brutal in its flatness and complete absence of curves. Likewise, the walls of the house were plain, featureless surfaces that terminated on all sides in sharp, 90-degree angles. Six broad, rectangular columns, spaced equally apart at the front of the building, climbed up from the ground to meet a forward overhang that projected from the roof. Midway, the columns supported a crude clapboard balcony that ran the length of the upper story. Except for this front-facing balcony with its weathered wooden balustrade, and an attic room that protruded from the center of the sloped roof. The entire house was built from the huge slabs of pelled brick. The effect was to make the place seem more like a military bunker than a tranquil royal home. There were windows on both floors, tall rectangular panes of glass with hanging blinds inside that masked the interior of the house. The way into the place, however, seemed clear. A double screen door made mostly of gauze stood halfway along the lower porch, dead center at the foot of the house. Just inside the screens, a pair of tall wooden doors hung wide open. Kemper idly noticed there were a few seats and benches on the porch, along with what looked like a couple of old spring bedsteads that someone had propped up against the wall. If the sheriff wasn't here, Kemper didn't know what the hell to do. Let's get this over with. He sighed, then he started to walk up the low grassy bank towards the house. 
Aaron followed, and as they drew close, she caught sight of a rusty old mailbox standing where the house met up with the road. On top of the mailbox, some bent metal letters spelled out a name, presumably the name of the people who lived here, Hewitt. But hadn't Luda May said the sheriff's name was Hoyt? Perhaps Aaron had misheard her. Hewitt, Hoyt. Maybe it was an accent thing. Andy was sitting on the porch steps. He hadn't seen Jedediah since he'd told the boy to stop messing with the body. Neither had Pepper and Morgan. Jedediah had just taken off into the woods. Some time passed before the boy came back. He seemed to appear out of nowhere, coming hurriedly out of the trees with a peculiar smile on his face. Andy watched the kid very carefully. He wasn't exactly over the moon to see the little oddball. Pepper, on the other hand, was glad he was back. She felt she still might be able to help Jedediah in some way. Even if she couldn't, the boy would probably be better company than Andy and Morgan right now. As soon as Kemper had left, the two guys had buttoned it. Pepper was still sitting with Morgan right next to the entrance to the mill. She smiled to welcome the boy as he walked over to her. I drew a picture for you, he said, taking Pepper by surprise. Want I see it? Sure. She smiled. Jedediah reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a crumpled piece of paper. Gingerly, he handed it to her. Morgan looked on as she slowly unfolded the badly creased sheet. He half expected the picture to be covered in scratchy red pen, a childish rendition of Pepper dripping with blood. But the picture was quite charming. Yes, the picture was childish, and yes, it was clumsy and simple, but Jedediah's drawing of Pepper had an undeniable natural sweetness to it. Wow. Glowed Pepper. This is really good. You sure you're not just saying that? The boy questioned. Morgan was beginning to find the whole thing more than a touch surreal. Here they were, stuck at the House of Horrors, having to satisfy the creative temperament of Jedediah the Jungle Boy. <laughs> no. Said Pepper firmly. I swear, I like it. Jedediah watched her for any sign of a lie but didn't see one. She looked like she really thought his picture was good, so maybe... Wanna see the rest of them I done? He offered. More? Sure. Said Pepper enthusiastically. Then at Morgan pointedly. Don't we? Morgan looked at her, then at the kid. Of course we do. He managed... Then the two of them got up and began to follow Jedediah as he led them round to the side of the mill. Hey, where are you guys going? Andy called after them. Then he jumped to his feet and ran after them. They shouldn't be going anywhere without him like that. What if they ran into trouble? Right up close, the Hewitt farmhouse seemed even more forbidding. It stood like a squat mass of powerful stone, almost as if the original owner sought to terrify his cotton-picking slaves through the sheer unnerving form of the building's architecture. As Kemper walked the three or four steps that led up on the porch, Aaron took another look at the surrounding scenery. Unlike the Crawford Mill area, the land here was mostly open and grassy. There were a few trees standing about, but nothing like the overgrown trail they'd just come along. She climbed up and joined Kemper in front of the screen doors. They could hear classical music from a record player somewhere inside the house. The record was scratched. Kemper hesitated and they looked at each other for a brief moment before Aaron took the lead and knocked on the wooden frame of the gauze screen. Hello? She called. Anybody home? No response. All they could hear was the music from what now sounded like an old phonograph. They pressed their faces closer to the mesh and tried to see inside, but it was no use. Now Kemper tried knocking, only more loudly. Excuse me? He hollered, and he could hear his voice echo on the other side of the doors as if projected down a long hallway. Hello? Shouted Kemper, growing increasingly annoyed. 
Where the hell was the sheriff? The music stopped. Aaron and Kemper exchanged glances. Someone had turned off the phonograph. Someone had heard them. Someone was inside. What do you want? The voice came down from within the house. It was low, booming, and had a distinct deep south drawl about it. It sounded like an old man. Kemper pressed his face closer to the door, but still he couldn't see in. He certainly couldn't see whoever it was who had just called out to them. And then he heard something else, something like the growling of a small dog. Are you the sheriff? asked Aaron loudly. Do I look like the sheriff? came a reply. I don't know, called Aaron. I can't see you. Kemper scratched at his goatee. Nothing was going right today. Nothing. Jedediah took Pepper round to a low door at the side of the mill. He offered to let her go through first, but she just smiled until he got the message and opened the door himself. Inside, Pepper, Andy, and Morgan found themselves in a cramped area on the lower level of the gin. There was some light coming in from somewhere because, unlike the room by the front entrance, they could see in here just fine, but the light was still fairly dim and it was impossible to tell exactly where it was coming from. None of them were quite sure what this room was meant to be. There were cracked lead pipes running the length of the ceiling. There was more junk lying around, and they found more crazy stuff. Dolls, heads, broken bones, a torn photograph, a bent windscreen wiper. One wall was covered with pictures, scraps of paper stuck in a haphazard spread across the splintered boards. The pictures, most with ripped edges, were all drawn in Jedediah's simple hand and each picture was out of a different person. He'd drawn men, women, children, boys, girls, even what looked like dogs and cats, and other pets. And now he added Pepper's picture to the collection. Thanks, Jedediah. She said, moved by his touching gesture. I feel so honored. You sure about that? Mumbled Andy. If the drawing of Pepper was actually meant to be a representation of Pepper... Who were all the other people Jedediah had drawn? There were dozens of pictures up on the wall. Did Jedediah expect them to believe that all these people had come out of this shithole of a place? Maybe the people on the wall were Jedediah's imaginary friends. Whatever. Andy followed the display down towards the end of the room, where the wall and the pictures fell completely into shadow. Morgan stood just behind Andy's shoulder, and together the two of them were just able to make out that the half-hidden pictures were different to the stick caricatures Jedediah had shown them. The scratched images down here were grotesque and as riddled with implied and explicit violence as the perverted figurines and skulls outside the front of the mill. Hey, kid, said Morgan, unable to lift his bespectacled gaze from a crude drawing of a dagger-raped heart. You draw these too? It was the sound of the door being slammed shut. It had no effect on the light. Morgan looked around. Jedediah was gone. Pepper had been looking up at the pictures on the wall, Andy too. No one had been watching the kid. Pepper started to say that maybe they should, but Andy cut in. Go back to the van? Right. Quickly, Andy stepped up and took the lead, and the three of them rushed over towards the closed door. Outside, Jedediah ran away as fast as he could into the tortured grove. Step back from the door, the voice demanded. Aaron was certain it was an old man talking. She glanced at Kemper. He shrugged. What else could they do? They were right up against the screens. Hesitantly, they stepped back onto the porch and waited. Slowly, the doors opened. 
the squealing hinges were desperately in need of some lubricating oil. And finally, the old man inside the Hewitt house revealed himself in a wheelchair. The old man cautiously wheeled himself out onto the deck of the porch. He seemed to be sizing Kemper up, but he also kept Aaron in the corner of his eye. In fact, he was careful to make sure he could see everything as he came out to meet the two young people who'd been banging and hollering at his door. Aaron could see that the man had had a hard-working life. Beneath his plain, cream-colored cap, the man's face was like a flesh-toned model of the Grand Canyon. The sallow cheeks were a web of deep lines and creases. Even the man's nose was thick with wrinkles. He was clean-shaven, but his gray stubble was the kind of dogged growth no razor could ever wholly remove. And his eyes behind the plastic brown fade glasses were a cold steel blue. The man was wearing a sleeveless undershirt, so Aaron could see how years of hard labor had given the man's arms and upper chest a sparse, wiry strength that still served him. As he pushed himself along in the wheelchair, a pair of fading striped suspenders ran down the outside of his vest, fastened to his durable gray pants, which, oh God, only now did Aaron notice that both the man's legs ended at his knees. The fleshy, truncated stump knuckles stuck out through the bottom of his pants, which were pulled up around his thighs. Aaron didn't want her nausea to show, but this had caught her totally off guard. The old man was an amputee, and he made no attempt to hide that fact. A small, sandy-colored dog ran out of the house and jumped up onto the man's lap, but the old man ignored it. He remained stern as he looked at his new collars. Kemper noticed the man had a black walking cane in his right hand. Sheriff don't live here, said the man impatiently. That figures, said Kemper, balanced precariously on the edge of no longer giving a damn. Everywhere they went, they kept hearing the same tune. Sheriff not here. The man snapped Aaron a frosty stare. You can call him if you want. His offer shook her out of a daydream. Once she got over the side of his uh, twin stumps, she found herself watching the dog playfully pawing the man's thighs. Um, thanks. She stuttered. We'd appreciate it. Kemper wasn't sure whether phoning the sheriff from this place would do any better than phoning him from Luda Mays, but he was prepared to try. At least the old feller was harmless, with his legs and all. Aaron practically tiptoed round the old man's wheelchair and started to open the door. Wipe your feet, barked the old man. I like to keep a clean house. She looked down and saw the doormat. It was almost spotless. Quickly, she wiped her platforms, then started to head on inside. Kemper followed suit, scraping the dust off his shoes. But when he went to take the door from Aaron, he found the old man's cane barring his way. The dog started to growl. The old man looked up at Aaron. I said you can call him. Then to Kemper. You can wait outside. I'm not looking for trouble. As he said the last few words, the man in the wheelchair lifted his cane and prodded the capped end of the black stick up against Kemper's chest. The young man held up his hands. Okay, Chief. Don't shoot. But the old man wasn't smiling, not a bit of it. He removed the stick from Kemper's chest, then motioned Aaron to go on inside. Then he rolled his wheelchair back inside the house before finally using his cane to yank the door shut. Could this day get any more fucking annoying? Kemper shook his head and kicked the ground. It was all down to Aaron now. Inside, the man told Aaron she could call him Old Monty, which struck her as an old-fashioned name, but then everything about Monty was old-fashioned. Even the back of his wheelchair was made of wicker or something. And then there was this house. Unlike the grim exterior of the Hewitt farmstead, the interior was as conventional and as inviting as any American home. The long hallway had a nicely polished floor. The walls seemed tastefully decorated, if a little out of date and there was hardly a speck of dust about the place. 
She chided herself for even thinking it, but Aaron could not see how Monty could keep the house like this, not in his condition. Maybe he had a housekeeper, or maybe Aaron hadn't yet met all the family. She looked down the hallway. It ran the whole length of the house. There was an open door on the left and a closed door facing it on the right. Just past the closed door, a wide carpeted stairway climbed up the second floor, and there seemed to be a space under the stairs. Further along, various doors opened left and right off the corridor until the way finally ended in what seemed like a storage area. That part of the hall didn't get much light, but Aaron thought she could see some old boxes and bits of furniture down there. She also caught sight of something else. It could have been a door, but Aaron wasn't sure. Taking his time, the old man led Aaron through the open doorway to the left into a well-furnished living room, where all the furniture was draped with plastic slipcovers. In here, he said. I'll dial them for you. Then he rolled over to a museum piece telephone standing on an equally dated table, lifted the receiver, and began to make the call. Thanks, smiled Aaron nervously. While old Monty waited for someone to pick up at the other end, Aaron took a quick look around the room. Other than the faded wallpaper, all the ornaments and furnishings seemed to be in good condition, which wasn't surprising if the old man kept everything under dust covers. She saw the old phonograph that they'd heard earlier. There was an old 78 on the turntable, Mozart. There were pictures on the wall, sepia-tinted portrait photographs of people long since buried in their graves. There were lamps, small ornaments, a couple of vases. Aaron picked up a ceramic bowl of potpourri and inhaled. It was old and had gone off. She blew through her nose to clear the bad smell, then put the potpourri back on the table. A large brass fan was set up on the ceiling. Even though it turned, Aaron could barely feel it in the closeness of the late summer afternoon. Suddenly, Monty's cane came into view. It reached across in front of Aaron and nudged the potpourri bowl back to the exact place Aaron had first found it. The girl looked at old Monty and started to shrug apologetically, only to see that he was ready to hand her the phone. Kemper was still kicking about outside. Luda May, Jedediah, and now some old lunatic with his shins blown off. Wasn't there one normal person anywhere in this goddamn town? Thirty minutes. Aaron repeated down the phone. Believe me, I'll be there. Thank you, Sheriff. At long last, one of them had actually spoken with the Sheriff. Not Luda May, not old Monty, one of them. The sheriff had apologized and said he'd had to make some preparations that had delayed him, but he had confirmed that the old abandoned gin was indeed the Crawford Mill, and he guaranteed he'd be out there to meet them within the half hour. Aaron smiled. Like her mama always said, if you want something doing, you gotta do it yourself. And for the first time since that girl had shot herself, Aaron thought things were beginning to look up. She couldn't wait to tell Kemper. But when she turned around to thank old Monty for his help, the disabled farmer wasn't there. He must have left her alone to make the call in private, and now he was busy doing something around the house. He was a gentleman. In his condition, he had every right to be suspicious when strangers called. How could he defend himself? He had no neighbors who would hear if anything went wrong. No, Aaron completely understood old Monty's initial surliness and as far as she was concerned, they all owed the man a debt of gratitude. But now she was ready to be on her way. Thank you, she shouted, hoping he'd hear her wherever he was. I'm all set. She paused for a minute, but there was no reply. All the same, she had to get going. It had taken her and Kemper around 15 minutes to walk here, and now they had to make sure they were back in time for the sheriff. Taking one last look at the antique display of a living room, Aaron went out into the hallway. She could just see Kemper pacing impatiently through the screen door. Then she heard a muffled voice. Please. It was old Monty. He sounded put out. I, I need a little help. He called falteringly between sharp breaths. He was in some kind of difficulty, but where? I'm in the bathroom. He gasped. I fell. 
Now she got it. He left her alone to talk to the sheriff, gone to the john, and fallen off the wheelchair. She didn't want to be the cause of any discomfort for him, not after he'd helped her by letting her use the phone. Besides, Aaron would have looked out for anyone with his kind of disability. And now she could hear his dog. The barks were echoing, which meant the dog was probably with the old man in the bathroom. Quickly, she set off down the long hallway. She thought about calling Kemper, but didn't want to waste any time. She could hear the old man struggling, and a few moments later she found his wheelchair lying on its side in the middle of an open doorway. Half the chair was inside the hall, and the other half was just inside the large bathroom. Beyond, Aaron could see old Monty lying on the floor. He was struggling to lift himself up onto the toilet seat. As she watched, he pulled his catheter tube out of the toilet bowl, clearly embarrassed that all this was happening right in front of her, but what choice did he have? He called out to her. Could you just... Suddenly, a loud metallic whine scraped through the walls of the bathroom, drowning out the remainder of old Monty's sentence. A damaged faucet had kicked into life, jump-starting all the plumbing in the entire building. All around her, Aaron could hear the ear-splitting groan of straining lead pipes. Monty held out a hand to her. She couldn't hear him, but he needed her help. Carefully, she stepped over the wheelchair. She noticed the wash basin off to her left. Brown water was pouring in torrents from the faucet, only to run spiraling down the drain. She reached out. The old man took hold of her hand and started to pull. Aaron braced herself, tried to lift him. For such a thin man with a good part of his body missing, the old feller was extremely heavy and his grip was incredibly strong. Aaron had to pull real hard to... Something passed in the hallway behind her. It was hard getting in the right position. She had to kick the wheelchair aside and close the door so that she could get some leverage. Old Monty grabbed at her. He pulled on her. He strained, the two of them groping, clutching, panting, with exertion, struggling, fighting for control, getting nowhere, making no progress. The more Aaron tried to help, the more he seemed to be pulling her down. Kip! Kip! Kemper sat on the porch swing. He thought he'd heard Aaron talking on the phone a minute ago, but she seemed to have stopped. She better have good news. He took a pack of cigarettes out from one of the large utility pockets in his pants. With the skill of someone who's had plenty of practice, he shook a cigarette loose and popped it between his lips. He then put the packet away and indulged in the time-honored ritual of flipping open his lighter with the unmistakable tink and then slowly, coolly lighting the smoke. He put the lighter back and inhaled luxuriously. Place didn't look so bad out here. Wide open spaces, peace and quiet. He exhaled and glanced at his watch. It was getting late. Come on, Aaron. He said out loud. What the hell's taking so long? It was damned irritating to be just one wall away from knowing what was going on. Surely the old man had seen Aaron enough to realize they weren't going to hurt him. Kemper took another drag at the cigarette, then tossed it on the floor. Then he got up and headed inside the house. He was sick of waiting, and he wasn't going to let some old guy in a wheelchair mess him around any longer. However, the moment he walked through the door, Kemper stopped and took stock of his surroundings. He was in a long hallway. The place looked like something from the Civil War. Everything was so old, and there was a loud whining sound. It seemed to be coming from all over the place and reminded him of the noise made by trapped air in old water pipes. All the same, it was pretty loud. He couldn't see Aaron or the old guy, and thanks to that noise, he couldn't hear them either. So feeling inexplicably nervous, he set off slowly down the hall. A short way on, he came to the open stairway on the right. He didn't think Aaron would be up there, so he kept straight on down the... Hold it a minute there was something hanging on the wall beneath the stairs. He didn't know why, but it caught his eye for some reason. He went forward and took a closer look, but even a few inches away from the thing, he still had trouble making sense of it. It was a tiny rodent skull with bells in its eye sockets with feathers and more bells dangling beneath it on lengths of catgut. 
Suddenly, it hit Kemper that the skull was just like all the other weird shit they'd found back at the mill, and that's why the curio had attracted his attention. The eerie similarity had triggered his instincts long before he actually understood what it was. He took the skull down from the wall and turned it over in his hands. The bells jingled, a quiet but crystal clear sound. Taking care not to make any more noise, he slowly went to put the thing back when he noticed a door crack slightly ajar just behind him. He reached out towards the door, but forgot about that rat skull in his other hand. Before he knew it, the demented object was slipping through his fingers. It hit the polished floorboards in a cascade of ringing bells. Damn it! Hoping no one had heard him, Kemper stealthily bent down and reached forward. As the blurred figure swept behind him and brought the sledgehammer down on the back of his skull, the blow was merciless, pounding and bloody. Kemper fell, stunned, twitching, his limbs out of control, his bowels loosening, and his whole body relaxing in helpless defeat. He felt something grab hold of his hair and denim jacket. He was helpless, pulled sliding along the polished floor, stunned, feeling no pain, unable to move, beaten. Something had taken control of Kemper, and through concussed rolling eyes, he could barely make sense of the grappling bulk that now had complete mastery of his flesh. Through the descending haze, a voice in Kemper cried with fear, but there was no expression of it in his brutally enfeebled limbs. A floating space of horror opened up and consumed him as he took his first glimpse of the force that had crushed him. A man, big, powerful, bulky, a fat, quivering, excited body howling, squealing like a pig with hard-on excitement. The Destroyer. He had control of Kemper in a way the boy's mind could not accept. The face of the attacker was too much. Not possible. Just not possible. Thick, heavy boots pounding the floorboards as the squealing mound of fat grabbed at Kemper, pulled at him, ripped at his hair. Rough pants, filthy stains, blood, shit, dirt, piss. The top shirt dirty and striped, short sleeves revealing an undershirt tucked in at the elbow, inside two leather van braces, protecting and strengthening each of the forearms, and the heavy leather apron, jagged with crisscrossing lines of stitching, brown and stinking just like the dead girl in the van, an apron custom sewn from skin. Kemper focused on the fat fingered hands that manhandled total control of him, Fingers heavy with jewelry, signet rings, graduation rings, engagement rings, wedding rings. They pushed and pulled Kemper, leaving everywhere the fingerprints of overwhelming frustration. Kemper knew he was lost. Something was wrong and there was nothing he could do about it. He had no power. He had been dominated, crushed, and when he finally looked up into the face of the man who now owned him, he looked into the face of hell two insanely staring eyes and a fat-lipped, slobbering mouth full of rotting teeth encased in a mask made of human flesh. Kemper's master was wearing a real human face, skinned, decaying, and crudely stitched beneath a ripped scalp of someone else's black hair running thick with lice. The frustration. Aaron. Kemper had been overpowered by Leatherface who squealed and screamed like a fucking pig in the dying boy's face. You're not helping me, Aaron shouted. Just relax. What? Old Monty shouted back. It seemed as if the screeching from the faucet was getting even louder. On top of that, the damn dog wouldn't quit barking and running around. It was driving Aaron crazy. What the hell was going on here? Did the old man want her help or not? She grabbed hold of his wrist and tried even harder.
Kemper tried to resist, but he barely had control of his muscles. The sledgehammer had pounded the tissue of his brain, flooding the convoluted gray mass with blood. Try as hard as he might, there was nothing the boy could do except feel the outrage of his helplessness. Leatherface dragged Kemper down the full length of the hallway, past the closed bathroom door, to the darkened area at the end of the corridor. This part of the house was completely different from all the other rooms on the ground floor. It seemed to be used only for storage, and was a complete mess. In one corner of the room stood a pile of chairs, in another there was a linen basket and an old mattress next to a toolbox with what looked like a child's rag doll lying in it. But Kemper didn't pay any notice. The only thing he sensed was the change in atmosphere from normal house to bad house. He knew from the lousy condition of the storeroom that it acted like some kind of gateway, dividing the world he loved from the world he was going to die in. Set in the middle of the far wall was an industrial sliding door made of reinforced metal. The door was totally at odds with the rest of the farmhouse, incongruous with the plantation style. Rusty, scratched, heavy, the door was the kind you'd expect to find leading to the cold room of a slaughterhouse, and now the door was wide open, revealing a small room bathed in a cold green light, a room with blood on the walls. Kemper lay slumped, his head bleeding as Leatherface dragged him by the shirt towards the open doorway. The boy's arms hung limply by his side as his body slid along the dirty floor. What he could see of Leatherface's own skin beneath the full head human mask seemed red and raw. Kemper tried to speak, to tell the bastard to go to hell, but he couldn't even do that. With one final spastic heave, Leatherface threw Kemper's limp body in through the door and shambled in after him. He then turned and with one final sickening whine grabbed hold of that door and slammed it shut with the colossal crash of metal that shook the entire house. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 6 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Once again, great job by our entire voice cast. Tonight we added Liam Anderson as Old Monty. Uh, yeah, the story's really kicking into high gear now. The Sheriff's on his way, one of my favorite characters from the remake. And uh, Kemper's been taken by Leatherface. I gotta say, I love the way that uh, Stephen Hand wrote this scene. It really put the whole plan into view better than the movie. Monty distracting the girl. Leatherface taking uh, Kemper. Um, we know we're going to see Kemper at least one more time if it goes by the movie. We'll find out. Uh, but, uh, you know, Stephen Palomo has been playing Kemper. Great job, Stephen. Thank you so much for that and for supporting the channel. Uh, I'm looking forward to see what comes next, guys. Stephen Hand has not disappointed me so far. Uh, this attack by Leatherface was great, the description of Leatherface was very vivid, and it really played out the sense of dread, uh, you know, Leatherface and Monty working together to make this happen. And, uh, meanwhile, Jedediah out there with Andy Morgan and Pepper, just creepy as shit, uh, with all the, uh, weird drawings and stuff they found in that room, and they've been left in that room now, and Jedediah's, uh, fled. Uh, so, I'll be back very soon with Chapter 7. I think the sheriff's going to be showing up. I'm looking forward to that. Hope you are too. Let me know what you thought of tonight's chapter, what you think of the book so far, and I'll see you very soon with chapter 7. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and yes, the jump scare is going to be here. How about this time I tell you I'm going to count to five, and at five is when it's going to start, okay? One, 